Um, just out of curiosity, does anyone ever lose socks? Like, <laughs> like, like, I know, like, okay, this has nothing to do with my message this morning, but it was a reality I was facing. I was trying to pick out socks for this morning, and I have like this growing collection of single socks. I don't know where they all go. I don't know if they get sucked up into the dryer and the type of, there is no way that this means anything of anything we're talking about other than I share burdens with you guys uh, as well in life. I don't know where these socks, I'm kidding, I counted 17 different socks and these aren't like mix matchy socks where they're intentionally not like 17 very distinct socks that don't have a counterpart. You know, it's kind of like a mixer in college. Everyone's just there trying to find their other half and, and, and no one's having any luck or something, I guess. I don't know. Um, but one of the things they do say, so if you actually have an invention um, that, that can keep socks together, there's probably some mom who's got some hack, here's what you do, all that type of stuff. I don't have that type of time. My wife usually does my laundry anyway, so, you know, we're just going to move on. And uh, they say, though, that innovation is the difference between where you are and where you want to be without having the resources to get there. And some of you might know that as a business owner, a small business owner, maybe you've created something, maybe in your job, that is your job to innovate. And there's no one in my mind that exemplifies innovation except for one group of people above and beyond everyone else, and that's the broke college kid. Think about when you were broken in college and there's all of these things that you wanted in life or needed in life, you have no money to do them and so you just kind of, there's nothing that a bunch of duct tape presumably couldn't fix. All safety is thrown out the window for the sake of trying to pull something off. Let me give you a few examples of college innovation that I have found on the internet this week. Here's the first one. Now we all know that uh, men's dorms smell bad. And so instead of cleaning up, instead of taking out the garbage, instead of doing the laundry, you just get a dryer sheet, put it in front of a fan, and boom, air freshener. I think it's ingenious. Gives a whole new def definition to that. What about this one? We know that, uh, that sometimes the, the meal plans aren't the best, but you've... You get kind of uh, the budget cereal. You get like the giant 12-pound bag of like Captain Berries from Walmart. And so you need some milk to take home. So why not just take a whole gallon with you? I may or may not have done this in the past when I was in college. Um, but we're saved by grace. Moving on. Uh, this one was arguably my favorite. You're in the library. You're wanting to relax, but those chairs, they're just a little, a little too stiff. And so why not just bring your own hammock, string it up, and then enjoy some study time together? You know, one of the things that we did in college, uh, we, in Knoxville, Tennessee, you're in the foothills, and so trying to watch football on Sundays was a very difficult task. And so we had these things called bunny ears, okay? So kids, this is what it was. It was like an antenna, two antennas, and you directed them around, and you picked up some type of signal. But we only got CBS, and we all know the best football happens on Fox. And so one Sunday afternoon, my friend is holding it, trying to adjust, and if he held it, it, if he stood there and held it with tin foil around his hand, then we could get Fox for the whole Sunday. So we just took turns, quarter after quarter, standing at the window with tin foil wrapped around our hands, enjoying some football. And that story always reminds me of something that uh, probably most of us had at some point or another, and it was one of these bad boys. Who had one of these at some point in your life? Show of hands, proud. When these came out, this was like a multimedia dream. You mean it plays CDs and the radio? Kids, what the radio is, is this little thing that exists. On, there's these towers and you got to adjust. And it was like a brilliant thing because you could do your CDs. And then on the back is called the what? Come on, this isn't a trick question. It's the tuning knob, okay? Some of you are like, oh, that's okay. So you got to tune in order to find it. Because here's the truth about the radio, is the airwaves are always open. The music's always playing, and so then it's your job to tune your radio to a channel in which you maybe like it, or at least that you can get reception of. And then once you found that perfect spot, you had to like mark it and kind of hold it there, because a slight bump either way, and nobody likes that. And here's my thing. Here's why I want to use this as a jumping off point this morning. is this idea of seeking and being in tune. Have you ever felt that way in a relationship before? You ever felt that way perhaps in a relationship with a friend, a coworker, a boss, a spouse, a child? Where you know the airwaves are open, you know the relationship is out there, but you're not quite in sync. 
that there's some tuning happening and yet you can't seem to land on the same channel. I bet that you have felt that way at some point in your life and will feel that way at some point in your life. Now let me ask you, what about your relationship with God? You ever been there before too? Where you know the, that God is out there, you know that he's real, you know that the message is kind of uh, is available for us to tune into, but you're not quite in sync like you used to be. You used to zone in on that channel, but now there's a little bit of static that has creeped in. Maybe that's why you're here this morning. Maybe you woke up yesterday, or maybe you made the decision earlier in this week. They always say that going to church on Sunday is a decision you make earlier in the week. And maybe that was why you said, you know what? I haven't really been hearing from God. I haven't felt in sync with God, so I'm going to try going back to church and see if I can figure that out. Or maybe you're just exploring faith altogether. You're exploring uh, spirituality and you're, you're trying out the different channels. Or if you're like me, maybe you find yourself sometimes like, man, I used to really know where that channel was, but it's been a while since I've really felt in tune. Because God's message is always out there. It's always playing. It's never passive. He is always relentless in his pursuit of you. His gospel full of love and grace and mercy. His desire to give you a purpose and meaning and to redeem and restore the world. But oftentimes, it's not God withholding his message. It's us who have inadvertently changed the channel. And we need to seek and tune our lives back into him. So as we continue in our study through the book of Acts, I want you to keep that idea of what does it mean, what does it look like to be in tune with God. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 12. If you're taking notes, you can get that note sheet out. We are continuing. We are 12 weeks into our study of the book of Acts. Spoiler alert, we're not even halfway yet. So this has been a great series so far, week after week. But this whole entire point, here's what I want to start with. This whole entire book at this point has been about these group of first Christians called the apostles, the disciples, the first church, and how they have lived in tune with God up until this point. Then Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Jesus sends his spirit and says, my spirit will live in you to fulfill my message to the entire world. Now go and do likewise. And we've seen some pretty amazing stuff. Some miracles, some people, some, some, some demons cast out, some amazing things happening as these disciples are living in tune with God. But then this thing called persecution begins to happen. And some of the disciples begin to retreat. Some of the disciples become a little bit more cautious. And today we're going to see from Peter another case of persecution, but how he is led through it through the power of God. And this is more or less one of the last times we'll see the apostle Peter in the book of Acts. So we're kicking off Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1. You follow along with me. It says this. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, meaning they just chopped his head off. When he saw this, met with approval from among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. That's also what we call Passover. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. And Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So here it is. There's this guy by the name of Herod, and he doesn't like the Christians. And so he goes after one of the apostles named James, cuts his head off. Death by sword. And then it says that the Jews like this so much that he's like, oh, that was fun for you guys? Cool. Where's that Peter guy at? He's kind of causing a ruckus too. Let me go after him as well. You see, this is King Herod. This isn't the same Herod as the Herod in the birth of Jesus. That was Herod the Great. This is Herod Agrippa, the grandson. But you notice something kind of unfortunate about their lineage. They go to some extreme measures to stop the movement of God. Herod the Great tried genocide, didn't work. Herod Agrippa is using just flat out blunt force to stop the church of God's mission and redemption, his gospel to move forward. And the question is, well, why? Verse three, it pleased the Jews. It was almost like he, he got this approval. And so then he proceeded then to do it more. Peer pressure is a powerful thing, isn't it? The currents of our culture 
have a force to take us down routes that perhaps if we're not paying attention. Let me give you an example. Let's say you went back in time 10 years and you had like a 12-year-old son and you say, hey, son, you given any thought to what you want to be when you grow up? Maybe, you know, lawyer, doctor, businessman, astronaut, police officer. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, dad, I've been thinking about it. You know what I'd really like to do? It's just play video games. And then I'm going to like have people watch me online and then I'll just get paid to do it. Let's say you had a daughter. Honey, have you decided what you, ever you thought of like maybe what you want to be when you're, you want to be a girl boss? You want to maybe open a salon? Like, like what is it that you want to do? You know, I'm just going to take like a selfie every day, post it online. Every, like every couple days, I'm going to learn a 30 second dance and post it to social media. And then at some point, just I'll get rich doing that. You would have laughed in their face. <laughs> you got to get a real job. There's no way anybody could make a living doing that. Fast forward to the year 2022, Webster's Dictionary added the phrase, the term influencer to the dictionary. Why? Because there are young people, I don't really know if there's old influencers, that's kind of like the point, right? Who their job, their platform, is to influence culture through their social media accounts. Now, influencing has been a thing of the past. The very first influencer that history tells us about is this uh, man by the name of Wedgwood. This is back in the mid-1700s. He had this brilliant idea. He would make these ornate tea sets, but had a hard time getting people to buy them. So he had this thought. If I take one to the king and queen, and they use it, and they like it, then I could stamp on all of my other sets. These are royal approved. And he did it, and it worked. And from that point, his business took off and boomed. In the 1920s, Coco Chanel was ordained, so to speak, as the first ever fashion icon, meaning what she wore, what she designed, what she put on her body was the litmus for all fashion moving forward. Influence, peer pressure is a thing in which we live in today. It's defined as someone whose popularity provides a system of approval. Why did Herod kill James? Why did he arrest Peter? because it pleased the Jews. It was politically popular to kill Christians back then. Instead of doing what was right, he went with what culture said. And this is something that I think we all know, but in order to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, it often means we have to swim upstream against culture. That in order to live this life faithfully and obedient to Jesus, there are many things in which we have to find ourselves swimming against culture. Because culture says, you need to look like us. You need to think like us. You need to act like us. You need to prioritize what we prioritize, value what we say is worth something. Culture never says the other way around. Never have I ever really seen a situation in which culture is like, hmm, but the churches and the Christians, they got a really good point over there. So why don't we just kind of all adjust to what they have to say? That being a faithful, obedient disciple of Jesus means you have to swim upstream against culture. And that can be hard, can it not? That can be tiring, that can be exhausting, but what we believe about God, what we believe about his word is that we trust the goodness waiting for us. That the strongholds of culture are no match for the power and presence of God because we know without a, without, without a shadow of a doubt that what is waiting for us is a joy incomparable to the riches of this life. So my heart for you and your faith, my heart for us as a church, as a community of faith, is that we are committed to that life of discipleship. We are committed to swimming upstream against culture, knowing that we have to do this together, that we cannot rely on our strength, but that we want to see men lead their households. We want to see marriages that are stronger. We want to see the raising of kids. We want to see the prioritization of all things that give God glory. And a lot of those things require swimming upstream against culture. But we're going to be the church that does that. We're going to be the church that prioritizes that, and we're not going to ever be ashamed about your call and my call and our call to say, here's where culture is going, but the gospel commands us to do it a different way, and we are sold out to living in that manner. 
No matter how many other people it might please, we're going to do things differently. And this story gives us perhaps a little hint of where that power comes from. We're going to pick up back in verse 5, and I'm going to read the rest of, of this story with, with Peter here, of what happens after he gets thrown in prison. It's like 14 verses, so follow along with me here. And it says this. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That's important. Remember that. The night before Herod was set to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentry stood at the entrance, a.k.a. maximum security. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, stuck Peter on the side, and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. Hop on my back. Let's go. We're going to Rambo out of this joint. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. So Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed through the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. There's no Bluetooth garage doors back then. And when they went through it, And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a shadow of a doubt it is the Lord and he sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to him and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed and ran back without opening it, exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had happened to Peter. After Herod had made a thorough search for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. I, uh, I get night terrors. I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to share something personal. I get night terrors. And usually when I get night terrors, it's early on at night. So I like to go to bed early, 8.30, 9 o'clock type of deal. And so my wife's staying up. And usually it's before she falls asleep. And so all of a sudden I start screaming. I start flinching. I start sweating. And then I kind of, she has to like jolt me awake. And then it's kind of like, okay, that was a, okay. Then I fall back asleep. And as a kid, I used to sleepwalk too. Like there was no, there was no bars of what, of what I would do. There was this one time my mom recounts this story that uh, she was sleeping in like the middle of the night. She had some double doors that led to her bedroom. I like walked in and poosh, kicked him open and then just stood there like an action hero. And then I exclaimed, when are we going on vacation? <laughs> and she was like, um, go to your room. And I was like, I, and I went back to bed. True story. Maybe you know someone who gets night terrors. Maybe you have a kid who sleepwalks or sleep talks. But there's always, there, if you are one of those, those people, if you are though, you can relate to this. The great euphoria that when you wake up and you realize it was just a dream is amazing. Like I get that one time where like you wake up in the middle of the night and you look like there's like someone in the corner. And so you, like, you freeze, you're just like, someone's here Finally. Finally, yeah, all all the things I did back, all the lunches that I stole in middle school, they're catching up to me, they're coming to get me. And then you have that thought, it's like, oh yeah, if they wanted to take me out, they would have moved by now too. And then it was just like your sweatshirt hanging on a door. But that feeling of like, oh, just a dream. Peter has the exact opposite. He wakes up from what he thinks is a vision to realize it's real life. He was in prison for nothing other than being faithful to Jesus. An angel comes in and is like, yo, I'm busting you out of here. Let's go. And he's like, okay. And then they leave town. They leave the guards. They get past everything. And then he wakes up and he's like, that wasn't a dream. Like this isn't Inception level three happening. This is real. And so then he goes to tell everyone else. And so he goes to the door. And if he put his ear against the door, he would hear them praying. 
Lord, we pray, we ask that you, that you, you save, you give your protection against Peter. And so he knocks. And someone goes to the door and they send a the little girl. Who could be knocking at this hour? So she goes to the door. She says, who is it? It's me, Pete. What? we just been praying for Pete. And now he's here. Did God do something? This is amazing. So she goes back and she tells the people, guys, God just answered your prayers. And their response, no, 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 that's not it. Pete's out there. It's Pete. Like, someone let me in here. Come on. Like, you know, that's the secret code. But their response is so peculiar. And their response hits so close to home for me. See, one of my greatest concerns for myself, one of my greatest concerns as a pastor, is when we see the movement and the power of God, yet we don't think that's how he should work. Or we're unafraid to think maybe he would actually answer that prayer. I had lunch with someone in our church this week, and he gave me a good illustration, a stark reminder. He says it's like this. He said, following Jesus, it's like being handed the keys to a spiritual sports car, but then being content to drive it around like a Prius. You ever get scared, perhaps, of the power of God? Maybe worse, you don't actually think he would do something in your life. You don't think he would actually come through. You don't think he would actually move. Perhaps we don't want to tap into that power. Perhaps we know that if we give him the keys and we let him drive around, we don't want to know where he's going to take us. Some of us say, you know what? I've liked the life that I've developed. I've liked the way that I go through. I've liked the steady pace and everything that I have going on here instead. And Jesus is saying, if you knew that the power of my spirit living in you you would have a drive, so to speak, that is worth driving each and every day. And that's essentially what the disciples have done. They saw the need. They were praying for deliverance. God hits the gas, and then they hit the brakes, saying, no. Nah. They weren't quite in tune with God. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, uh, just to draw two things out of this, is this. Is do we believe in the power of God? Do you believe in the power of prayer? That the spirit of the almighty, living, sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent, living God lives inside of you if you have professed faith in Jesus. This isn't a sermon about do you pray? Should you pray? How do you pray? This is a sermon about why pray? Because I don't want to have a church filled with disciples. I don't want to be a disciple who leaves spiritual horsepower on the table, so to speak. And one of the greatest ways in which we seek and get in tune with God and see that power is through prayer and prayer alone. But we have to believe it. We have to buy into it. So whether you're a staff member, an elder, whether you're married, single, divorced, whether you're a tender, someone who serves, someone gives, the whole church runs off of one type of power, that's Holy Spirit power. It's kind of Southern baptist -y thing right there. But you get what I'm saying. And that's the type of power that we have been handed. That's why our elders have prioritized prayer for the last two years almost. Every single month there's an opportunity to come together. It's an open invitation for anyone in our church to come and pray with some staff, pray with some elders, because we believe in the power of prayer. Coming up in just a couple weeks, August uh, 16th, at Urbana location, we're praying for schools, we're praying for teachers, we're praying for those who have influence for it to be stewarded well for the kingdom of God. Why? Because we believe in the power of prayer. So two quick thoughts on this. Number one, so we see is that our job is to pray, but it's God's job to answer. Our job is to pray. That's it. It's God's job to answer those prayers. Prayer is more of an art than it is a science. There's no magic formula that if you say the right words in the right way, then God must answer them. Like you ever meet someone who, uh, as soon as they begin to pray, all of a sudden their, their vocabulary turns like old English? Like if they're just having a normal conversation, maybe you're at lunch, all right, do you want to like pray for the food? And oh, sure, I'd love to. Oh, Heavenly Father, ye old Father God. 
thou is the bestest, most magnificent human creature, creator that there else has ever thus been. Like, you ever meet someone where they're like, they, they just all of a sudden start using this like gibberish? It's like, I don't even know what half those words mean. There's no secret to prayer. There's no special way that says, this is, this is the secret thing. If you say with these words or this tone or this inflection, or if you pray for this long, then God must answer your prayers. There's none of that that exists. But Jesus did say, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. Jesus didn't say, if you happen to pray. He said, when you pray. Consider this. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. So let me just ask you this morning. This is the most convicting question that I could think of. And I asked myself this. What if God answered all of your prayers? Let's say you have a prayer list and God said yes to all of them or answered them in the way that in which you would, what would change in your life? What would change in your home? What would change in your community? If God answered all of your prayers, what would be different? Would you have more money in the bank account? Would you finally get that promotion? Would that crazy neighbor who lives beside you throws parties like every single weekend finally move away? I don't know. Or would there be friends or family members who all of a sudden would find faith in Jesus? If God answered all your prayers, would your marriage be stronger? Would your relationship with your kids be more Christ-centered? What would happen if God answered all your prayers? Here's the other question. If God answered all your prayers, would anything be done? Do you even have a prayer list in which you are seeking after the power of God in your life for his glory? Our job is to pray, but it's God's job to answer. Here's the second thought. It is our job to pray to God, but it's God's job to be God. Prayer reminds us of who we place our faith and trust in. And maybe we underestimate the power of prayer because oftentimes we find ourselves praying, focusing on what instead of the who we are praying to. Why is it that as the early church was praying for Peter's release, God answered that they didn't believe it? My guess is they were praying focused on what? God, here's what I want you to do. Here's what we would like for you to do. Forgetting who they were praying to. God, I'm going to put this before you because I know I'm supposed to. I know this is a nice thing that we should probably do, but at the end of the day, it's probably not feasible, so I'm just going to do it as a formality. And God's like, you forgot who you're playing with here. You forgot who has the power to do the miraculous. Our job is to pray to God. It's God's job to be God. Why did God spare Peter, though, and not James? They were probably prayed for James when he was taken as well, too. Well, maybe that's part of your story that you struggle with. Why did my loved one not fight or win the fight against cancer? Why is it that their child and those treatments work for theirs and not mine? Why isn't that we, we've prayed diligently for the child, but the infertility treatments didn't work for us, but it did for them? Why is it that their family seems to have making a beeline for the cross, yet mine want nothing to do with me and my faith? The truth of that is I don't have an answer. There's no difference between why did God spare Peter and not James than why did this person get healed and this person didn't. But what I do know is not because perhaps that you don't have faith has nothing to do with the fact that God doesn't love you or you love him. But there is a spiritual war going on in this life that Satan and sin takes what God had created and intended for good and has twisted it. And sometimes God does do the miraculous and other times he doesn't. And I have no answer to that other than it's God's job to do God things. It's my job just to remind myself God gets to be God and I don't. 
That's one of the questions I lived with my entire life. God, how come my father didn't pull through cancer? Is he in heaven with you now or not? I don't know. How come? But here's what I do know. I'm standing here today. And there's a very real chance and possibility that if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here today. Does that mean God intentionally uses bad things so that good things can I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, chapter, uh, or sorry, Romans 8, 28. Paul says this. Put it on the screen, you can read it with me. He says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. God is good. He is the most good thing that there is and the most good thing that exists. And his chief concern isn't for you to have everything this life has to offer, but his chief concern is for you to have more of him each and every day. And the truest, most fundamental way in which we tap into that goodness is through our prayers with him. It's because our prayer is like a radio where we tune into the goodness of God. Say that again, prayer is how we tune into the goodness and into the power of God. So I want to close with this thought and this illustration. What happens when we don't pray? What happens when we don't pray? Well, does God stop loving us? Does it mean we don't actually have faith or actually love him? Does it mean he withholds blessing or purpose from our life? Let me give you this illustration instead of maybe trying to answer that directly. I'll show you a picture here. This is from my wedding a little over 10 years ago on the screen. If you can try to find me, you can, you can probably find me pretty easy. I'm there, the fourth person from, <laughs> it took me a while. Oh, yeah, where am I in this photo again? I'm that one on the far left. That's me in this photo. Um, some of you are just now getting that. All right. It's early. Get some coffee. It's all good. Going from far right to left, far right, that's my brother-in-law, Stephen. He officiated our wedding. The next to him is, his name is Taylor, uh, one of my best friends from high school. Next to me on one side is Stephen, best friend from high school. Other side of me, uh, my other friend, Danny, best friend, high school, early college. Uh, he was my best man. And then you have Diana's family beyond there. Here's the interesting, it's been 10 years since I've been married. My three, I guess, prominent groomsmen collectively I've probably talked to those three guys about four or five hours in the last 10 years. None of them live in the area. None of them, um, you know, uh, Stephen's an orthodontist in upstate New York. Danny uh, is in Colorado, runs a business with his brother, my friend Taylor. Uh, if you're familiar with Reef uh, Clothing, he's the project designer and manager for Reef Clothing back in San Diego. These men, 10 years ago, stood next to me as I made the second greatest decision of my, wife, my life, which was to marry my wife, Diana. Monumental influence in my life, but in the last 10 years, I've barely spoken with them. Does it mean I don't love them? Does it mean they don't love me? Does it necessarily mean that there was a, a falling out or that we got sideways or something? No, what it simply means is we have grown apart. But the relationship isn't nearly as strong as it once was. What happens when we don't pray? What happens when you don't speak to your groomsmen for 10 years? Things just kind of start to drift. The intentionality is not there like it once was. The commitment isn't there like it once was. The joy for the relationship isn't there like it once was. Doesn't mean I don't love them. Doesn't mean that I don't care about them. But it does mean it's not as strong as it used to be. It's not as influential or important as it once was. there is a very difficult thing in faith that we are called to do and that's our call to be obedient to pursue him and, and, and my challenge for each and every one of us 
is to remind ourselves how we get in tune with God yet again. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all together. Have you ever try to like build a habit and then like you start off Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday, you kind of slip and then Thursday eh, and then Friday, you're like, it's the weekend. And then you hit Saturday and everything is out the window. And then you tell yourself, you know what? It wasn't a good week to start. I'm going to start this week again. And then Monday comes and you're going good. And then Tuesday things are, and then Wednesday gets rocky again. You know what I'm talking about. The beauty about God is God has said, the airwaves are always open. My love, my peace, my compassion, my understanding is always there for you. My power through my spirit. But you have to be in tune. You have to seek me with your life, with your decisions, with your time. Let's not be like those disciples in which we pray to God and then think, oh, I guess this isn't really what he wants to be. So what would it look like for you this week? to get back in tune with God? What would it look like for you to be the husband that says something like, you know what? I've never really prayed for my family or prayed over my spouse, but I'm gonna get in tune and in sync with that. What would it be like to be a parent who says, I wanna raise my kids to love and follow Jesus? What would it be like to get in sync with God to say, it's been a while since I've been in church. It's been a while since I've given to the church. It's been a while since I've served the church. What happens when we don't pray is we slowly get out of tune. But God's always there. You can find me. You just have to seek me. Would you pray with me as we worship this morning? Heavenly Father, we worship you. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, your power in our lives. May we never neglect or forget about what it is that you do in us and through us. I praise you, Lord, first and foremost for the way in which you graciously love us and pursue us. Regardless of what we've done, regardless of how long it's been, regardless of how many times we change the channel or don't stay on the channel, God, I thank you that your love is not dependent on how well we seek you, but your love is dependent on how well you have already sought us. Give us the power of your spirit. Give us the anticipation that when we pray, that when we seek you, not only will we find you, but we will find the miraculous happening in our lives. The miraculous that gives you glory. We offer this prayer to you expecting, God, I, I pray this morning expecting that your spirit transforms lives today, transform lives this week, this month. I pray expectantly, Lord, that there will be sin that will be overcome. I pray expectantly that there'll be marriages that will be restored. I pray expectantly that there are kids and parents whose relationships will be strong. I, I pray expectantly that there are people who don't know you, who will come to know you because of the faithful obedience of people in this church, because it is your power that you've given to us. We lift these things to you. Amen.